consciousness and the cosmos. In physics, the observer effect is the theory that simply observing a situation or phenomenon necessarily changes that phenomenon. So, what exactly is the role of the observer? The question of the role of the observer in uh, physical experiments begins at the subatomic level when uh, particles such as electrons or photons are traveling, they're traveling like waves, but once the observer makes the observation, that wave function collapses, so to speak. So it appears that the measurement itself affects the results of the physical experiment. And it appears as though the measurer, the subjectivity of the scientist, actually affects what happens in the objective world. And so, is it possible that this split between the subject and object is becoming overcome, so to speak, at the subatomic level? Well, we don't have the answer to that, but boy, we have a lot more questions now than we did 100 years ago. Prior to the 20th century, the way we thought about matter was more like inert particles, more atomistic, you know, like little billiard balls type thing. Thanks to Einstein, who began to realize that matter and energy are interconvertible, uh, that, that was a revolutionary discovery, I think, that set the pace for the rise of quantum, quantum physics. And so this notion of mind and matter really emerges out of the world of quantum physics. What is the relationship between mind and matter? What we call matter is not something that can be identified apart from the act of observation, which is the role of the observer. So this is a really fascinating um, phenomenon of nature, the deep, deep interconnectedness of, nature, of matter itself. So the observer, in a sense, is the very thing that's being observed, right? So if I observe matter and I am matter, then that which I'm observing is me, and yet the me you know, that's observing can name what it is. So there's this kind of very fascinating, almost a recursive type, a loop in this material universe that it's consciousness that in a sense um, makes this loop dynamic. Why does the mind make a choice for this uh, rather than that. And that, I mean, that notion of the mind as the activity of consciousness and the way that the mind will focus the observer on a particular thing is still, I think, um, largely an, an area for exploration. What is it about us that shapes our intention to become conscious of, of this, what I'm naming here, and, and what is not here. So why do I name this as a particle? Why do I see a particle rather than a wave? Why do I name it, you know, this type of things. If you were to go back maybe 100 or 200 years when classical physics was, was developing, uh, the question about the role of the observer was not even a question that anybody asked because it was assumed through common sense that you look at the world and the world is what it is. Well, if there's anything that we've learned from science is that common sense is a very poor arbiter of the way that reality is really working. So quantum mechanics has made a step up into saying, well, there's something about observers that is interacting with the world in some way. So what is the significance? At this point, probably the consensus is that it's, it may have, maybe there's a little effect, but it doesn't have much of, of an effect at all. But I would say that that is assuming that we're dealing with human consciousness. That it's like humans are not creating the world simply by looking at it. That is one of the objections that comes up. I said, well, if there weren't any humans, would the universe be here? We can look backwards in time in astronomy and see back billions of years, but there weren't any humans, so how can that exist? So the response to that is that we're not talking about human consciousness. 
human consciousness and universal consciousness. The universal mind is infinite and omnipotent. It has unlimited resources at its command. The only difference between our subconscious mind and the universal mind is of degree. They are the same in kind and quality. The difference is one of degree only. Human consciousness you can think of as a little c. Consciousness with a c. That's kind of like this stuff. But from an idealistic point of view, there's a consciousness with a big C, of which the little C is a little tiny piece. So human consciousness in this picture then is, has the same elements as consciousness with a big C. So we have awareness, and we're talking about some primordial awareness that permeates everything. So the role of the observer from a big C perspective is it literally gives rise to the entire universe. This notion of mind and matter began to awaken some scientists to say that the background of the universe, in other words, the physical structure of the universe, is mind-like. Like there's a mindfulness in matter. The mind plays a critical role in what matter becomes. Teilhard de Jardin, just to kind of, you know, uh, put it out there, uh, in his view, evolution is the rise of consciousness. That's what the whole evolutionary universe is about. Does universal consciousness give rise to the cosmos? So in his view, consciousness is primary. It takes first place to matter. And we used to say matter, consciousness. Terry would say consciousness, matter. Consciousness gives rise to matter. From a philosophical position of idealism, that all there is is consciousness. And the physical world is a side effect of consciousness. So the consciousness is the key player. The conscious observer is the key player in what matter becomes. What is the role of the mind in the physical world? I often think of the role of mind in relationship to the physical world. For me, they can't be equated, and mind can't be eliminated by any kind of physics. Think of it as a long evolutionary process beginning with merely physical objects, and then we have the first cell, more and more complex organisms, with actually their own mental experiences already, let's say, in the primates. One of the fundamental characteristics of our universe is this concept called emergence, which is explained by complexity theory. And we, ourselves, we human beings, have emerged from the interactions of trillions and trillions of cells. Because ultimately that's what we are. And yet we're much more than the cells. We're not some big gelatinous mass here. There's organization, there's structure, and that is what emerges. With this huge brain and this broader way of being in the world, fewer instincts, more thought. Well, the mind or the thought arise out of that physical world but they take on a life of their own. And from that point on, we become, as I would say it, spiritual beings. We're beings who are still embodied. We have a mind that thinks and does mathematics, but along with mind comes this other dimension, this dimension that, if you will, moves upward. It finds places to exist and ways to interact and kinds of intuition and kinds of connection that we wouldn't otherwise have. I think it's beautiful to see a, a physics and a biology that leads us forward, but then to know ourselves as something different. So one might wonder 
how significant is this observer who measures and helps make the world the way it is? Maybe you'd want to say, oh, she just becomes aware of the world out there. She observes it and sees it for the first time. But that's not what the physics says. In this amazing meeting in Copenhagen in 1932, of the top uh, Heisenberg and the top physicists at the time, the Copenhagen interpretation became the normative interpretation of physics. What does that mean? It means that the human observer makes the world what it is. Makes the world what it is. Think about if you made that the center of your entire worldview. The mind plays a critical role in what matter becomes. And so, you know, this is, this is a huge leap from what we thought before. We thought matter, there it is, it just is, you know, it forms itself and mind is something that's, you know, consciousness just comes in later on. It is a world that from the very basis is given birth to by mind and matter together. That is for me a metaphor that moves through the entire history of the universe and the entire understanding of ourselves. We are the being who co-makes the world. And if we do it at the physics level, we do it at the biology level, that means we co-make life. At the cultural level, we co-make the culture that is the very world we live in. I would say if we're a spiritual being, that means that we make the world with a destiny or a movement toward its spiritual fulfillment. Physics to the spiritual interpretation of the whole.